friends, welcome to Cave of the Winds. Professor Batty here, looking to talk to you about something a little cool, if I might say. Science, of course. And there's science all around us in this world today. We study it in the air, we study it in the trees, in the ground. And science has been around longer than you think. It's not just from these days as we come to know, but it is, of course, in the past as well. And so let's talk first about a little science in the late 1800s, the early discoveries of this cave, of course. Let's take us back, huh? Hello there, Shirley Diggs of the Manitou Springs Journal. I am talking to you from the two sinkholes out here in Williams Canyon. Just a couple of days ago, two local boys, John and George Pickett, came up into this area and they heard these strange howling noises. And as they came up here, they found this massive crack just right up around in here. They crawled on through and they had their little candlestick with them, but it blew out in the middle of their journey. And they were so terrified, they claimed to everybody back home in Manitou Springs that they found a haunted cave. Nobody took them seriously at first. However, a gentleman by the name of George Schneider came up here armed to the teeth with shovels and pickaxes, ready for the massive journey he was about to take inside the earth. Let's take a look at what he saw, shall we? So here we are at the mouth of the cave. This is what John and George Pickett found, and they only went up 20 feet through this small tunnel before they hightailed it back home. But it was George Snyder who came all the way in, dug his way through, and he discovered a fantastic cave system up here. Let's go see what he found, shall we? Here we are inside the cave. It has been given the name Cave of the Winds. It has that name because of the two massive sinkholes just outside here. And whenever the wind blows over those two sinkholes, it makes those howling noises. And of course, the wind comes inside these tunnels here. Now, it has been said by scientists that our cave here roughly begins around 500 million years ago. Colorado back in those days used to be in shallow ocean waters. So back then, the plant life and sea life died, floated to the bottom of the ocean floor. Millions of years of consistent layering of all these elements and then it gets compressed together, turns it into this limestone rock. This is a type of sedimentary rock. And inside this rock is compressed seashells. This is what helps to give cave its little particular life, according to scientists. Now, when our Rocky Mountains were forming here in Colorado, you know how they're made. It's when the tectonic plates shift the land against each other, but eventually it compresses the rock together and it will crack. These cracks allow the water to finally seep into the rock itself, slowly eroding the rock from the inside. When the water comes in here, it's soaking up all the carbonation inside the rock, which turns into carbonic acid, and it eats the mineral from the shells inside here. The mineral is called calcite. That's what the acid likes to eat away. And so at the bottom of the crack, a slow hole begins to erode and expand in size, making these massive holes here, this beautiful cave that we are now going to explore in. Let's go a little further inside the cave, shall we? So when the water was coming here into the cave, slowly eroding the rock, it's rinsing away all the loose sediments. And then the water table starts to lower itself in here and the cave begins to grow and it expands in size, creating these huge, massive rooms we're gonna be walking into. So just above me here is what is called a solution dome. Now, far back up here is a huge flowstone formation where water came down through what is basically called a chimney and it filled up in here until the water began to erode away the floor, making a tiny hole and the water would start to pour on through. A vortex of water began to grow and it expanded in size, helping to create these huge domes which are scattered all throughout the cave system, moving this, giving it a nice unique look. 
Now, when you come to Cave of the Winds, you will see many different, beautiful, and unique formations in here. The fancy term for it is speleothems. It's the scientific name for them. Now, the classic two are your stalactites and stalagmites. Stalactites are made when the water is dripping from the ceiling, and then when the water drops off on the ground, it creates your stalagmites. But this massive one behind me here, this is called flow stone. This is made when water is flowing over surfaces. Now, as the water is running over the limestone rock, it's leaving behind traces of minerals that it's brought down from the earth. And when the water rinses away, the minerals still remain on there. So imagine this happening for thousands and thousands of years, creating these massive formations. Now, if you take a look right above my head here, you'll see some ribbon stalactites. Cavers like to call them cave bacon because it looks like a strip of bacon. And they're made when water is streaming across a slanted ceiling. Reporting for the Manitou Springs Journal, I'm Shirley Diggs here at Cave of the Winds. Thank you for such a wonderful look into our past. History hides so many things, including some scientific discoveries. But now it's time for us to delve even deeper. We're gonna go to the very back parts of the cave, into the darkness, what they call the dark zone. There are three different zones in the cave, but you'll come to learn that in time. For instance, I'd like you to go meet a friend of mine, Gail. She's gonna teach you about some of the many critters that live inside the cave. It can be such a biodiverse area that many people overlook it. But let's go talk about some of those favorite little creatures that visit the dark depths of the underworld. Oh, hi. Didn't expect to see you here. I'm Gail. Here at Cave of the Winds, I'm one of the troglozines. You may wonder, what's a troglozine? Well, when you're looking for animals in a cave, you have three different categories. Troglozines are ones like myself. We come in, we explore, and then we leave and go home. Another type of animal might be a troglophile. Troglophiles like to live around caves. They get advantages of being in here. You've got, well, the air is always about the same temperature. It's nice and comfortable year round, so they're happy in here. They love being in the cave. A third category might be called a troglobite. Those are the animals that live in the dark zones, and they are completely committed to living in a cave. We're lucky we might find one later. You never know what you're going to see in the cave. <gasps> right over there. There's one now. Oh, look, isn't she beautiful? This is one of our lampshade spiders. And really, they're not very big, maybe half an inch long in the body. And this is what they do. They like to hang out in caves. These are actually troglophiles. They love being around caves. They'll be at the entrance in the twilight zone. Their webs stick out from the wall, looking like kind of a lampshade. And these are not spiders that use sticky stuff for on their webs. What they do is they have their webbing, they comb it out and fluff it up, and it makes it look like cotton candy. And that way, that way if an animal does come along, a cricket or a beetle, they'll stumble into that cotton candy get their feet tangled and then the spider can catch them. It's a good way to make a living. If you're living in a cave, you need to have life in the slow lane. Oh, hey, I may be out here looking for critters, but there's some other things in here that are beautiful as well. Like right here, I have a special light. It's a UV light and it shows up how the water has run down the wall here. So there's cracks in the ceiling and those cracks let in water and the water leaves behind just a little bit of mineral. In this case, it's calcium carbonate. That's beautiful. Let's see what other things we can find in here. There are lots of mysteries to solve in a cave. Oh, hey, you're back. We're down here in the bowels of the earth. We're actually looking for millipedes. We're looking for troglobites a very special troglobite that lives down here in Cave of the Winds and nowhere else. It's called Coloradesmith manitou, or to you and me, that's a uh, millipede. But it's a special millipede. It only lives down here and nowhere else. 
like right here. I bet this is the perfect, oh, there we go. There's one right now, right there. They're only about half an inch long and they're all white. Oh, these guys are so teeny tiny. Oh, let me show you. If I have a dime here and put a dime right next to them, look how small they are. We're in a cave. There's no light, there's no plants. How can anything live down here? And that's the trick to being a troglobite. You have to have the uh, adaptations to be able to function down here. For one thing, it's life in the slow lane. These are animals that, well, any adaptation that allows them to put any energy that they manage to uh, bring in only goes to life support. So they don't have pigment, because who needs pigment? You're down here in the cave. A lot of these animals have longer antenna, longer legs, able to find food that's not very, well, it's just not very frequently found down here. There is food. Things come in with water. Things come in with us. I've been down here exploring, and actually I'm losing skin cells. That's a buffet for these guys. A little bit of fungus on it, and they're happy little animals. Well, let me get this out of the way. I'll leave this little fella alone to live out in peace. I'm going to continue out exploring this cave. Remember, as you go looking around, a cave habitat can be just as biodiverse as a rainforest. Wow, magnificent. What luck we had in finding those little beasties down there, huh? So tiny, so easy to miss. And without the proper equipment, it's very simple to miss. But now I want to take you to a very close personal friend of mine, somebody I know very well who has something to share with you. They want to talk to you about the importance of why we want to conserve these great and wonderful lands we live in. Just a little talk under the small ocean of depth that there is in conservation. Oh, thank you, Professor Batty. Oh, hello, my friends. And when you love to explore, especially caves, it's important to keep some things in mind, you know? For instance, safety. Even back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, George Snyder still had to think of some other things. He had to be safe, because when you go exploring caves, it could be all oh so rewarding, but it's just as dangerous as being out in the desert or stuck in the wildlands. So you must always be careful. Oh, I think I see something. Let's take a look, huh? Well, oh, do you feel that? I feel some wind. Let me take a test here. Ah, the air is going inside of this cave, which tells me that it's pulling air into it as the pressure changes between inside and out. Eventually, when that same pressure changes in the reverse, that air will come rushing outward. This tells me it's a pretty large cave, and from the looks of that drop, quite a ways down. I don't have the proper safety gear for this particular cave, but perhaps maybe another day we'll have to explore, huh? For now, let us go find a different cave. Ho, 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 look at here. It seems our searching has paid off. We've found ourselves a small cave. Luckily, I came prepared. You see, you never want to disturb the ecosystem or disrupt the cave itself. It's important to cover your hands and your skin. We want to keep our oils out of the limestone. It's a very delicate process, but many of these formations rely on the deposition of minerals into those tiny pores. If our oils get there, it becomes clogged and it cannot grow any crystals or formations. And it could take tens of thousands of years for it to get better. So best to wear the proper equipment. Of course, I will exercise safety as we get closer to our venue. It looks pretty inviting, but one thing we must always do is make sure that there's no wildlife inside. Caves break down into three different zones, and wildlife will sometimes shelter in what is called the first zone or the entrance zone, usually going no farther than 30 feet. So we're going to call in or shout. We're going to look for the signs of the animals, refuse, fecal matter, all of those wonderful science things. Hello in there. 
It looks clear. Let's go check it out. Wow, it really goes for quite some distance. And I can feel that cold air come rushing out. I bet this goes far back into the mountain. Perhaps maybe even connects to that first one we saw on our way. You see, cave systems really are marvelous, and they go quite a distance. But it's always important to remember to protect these lands we care about so much. There's so much science in this place. You see, these zones of the cave are very important to its ecosystem. Right now, we're in the entrance zone. Plenty of light, other animals may take shelter, some hawks even nest in this. But if we go just a little bit further in, we'll find ourselves in the twilight zone. Oh, and not the movie one you, your parents are used to. I mean, the dim part of the cave where there's not quite enough light for us humans, but enough for some of the other critters that come back there. And just past that twilight zone is the darkness of the cave. A truly magnificent place to be if you've got the right equipment. But all of this, it's important to preserve. See, many people don't know this, but caves, they're a part of our natural filter system. For instance, look here, look at these layerings. You could see the different strata of these lovely limestone. And there's just millions of years of science right here. But as the water makes its way through the cracks in the earth, and it finds itself deeper and deeper into the cave, it will be filtered out through the dirt, through this rock, and eventually it will make its way back to our lovely water table. This, we will eventually drink. So it's important that we never pollute our cave systems. We must conserve them for both the beauties of science and the natural wonders of our world. And my friends, it is up to you and to me to help take care of our lovely planet. Goodness gracious, such amazing information from a handsome fellow, no less. I see a Nobel Science Prize in the future for that one. But now, let's take a turn. I want to take our look outside to some of the trees that are all around you and I. Hello everyone, my name is John Sanchez. I work for Cave of the Winds, and I'm a certified master herbalist. I teach plants and trees around Colorado. Um, today we're going to be exploring trees. Now, most of us know something about trees. We know that it takes carbon from the atmosphere and it converts it into oxygen so we can live. But did you know it takes one tree to produce enough oxygen for four people? But on the other side of that, it takes four trees to remove the carbon imprint from our breath. Four trees for one person. So they're very important to our ecosystem. You've learned about caves early on. You've learned about underground. Now let's explore trees above the surface. You probably already know that trees are really important to our society. They help us in construction. They help us um, with, with cooking. They help us with heating. Did you know that 50% of the world still uses wood to cook and heat their home? So let's get into the benefit of trees. Now, it's all around us. We see it in construction of homes. We see it in the tools that we use. We see it in furniture that we build. It's all around us, and it's very necessary for our society to move forward. But the use of all those trees, it leaves, it leaves a problem. It leaves a problem with our ecosystem. Now, that problem is because we have to consume it at a faster rate than we can actually grow it. Now the history of trees goes back about 400 million years and it starts with a simple tree that's more like a fern and it reproduces somewhat like a mushroom with spores. Now it takes a while, those trees eventually go away and make coal beds for our modern coal mines that we use to run energy plants, stuff like that. So those go away and now the more modern trees start coming. Now they're spreading with seeds, they are angiosperms. Those angiosperms, they make up several thousand uh, species around the world. So now the opposite of that is uh, genosperms. Those genosperms make up about 300 species around the world. But we're gonna go ahead and stick to the trees and I'm gonna bring them to life for you. Um, did you know that a tree can see? Now, it, th that sounds spooky. It sounds like you're going through a haunted forest or something like that, and all the trees are watching you like some sort of movie. But here's how it rolls. The trees have more photoreceptors than a human eye. 
what they're concerned about is the position of the sun. They follow the position of the sun meticulously, and the position of the sun lets them know when they're supposed to come out of hibernation for the winter, when they're supposed to bloom. It sends off hormones through the system, and it's those photoreceptors that keeps track of all that. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. Can trees really see us, like 20-20 vision in detail? Well, it's not exactly like that. They have specialized eyes for their own survival. Their photoreceptors are specialized for seeing infrared light and ultraviolet light. Now, those two light sources are what's telling them the, the year, the position of, of the sun is telling them what season it's at. Now, when it gets to a certain position, um, the photoreceptors will signal into the tree that it's time to send in hormones and, and time to fruit. So those eyes are specialized and they are very important to the tree's survival. It's very important to knowing when it's time to hibernate. It's very important to know when it's time to wake up and start partaking in the sunshine. So other than, other than being able to see, do they speak? Yes, they do. Now they speak and we know this. It's a very scientific thing. But consider this, if you don't understand a language, does it really mean it doesn't exist? If you don't speak Mandarin, does it mean Mandarin doesn't exist? Because we don't understand the language of a tree, does it mean it doesn't exist? Well, it does. It exists. They speak to each other. There's a layer of mycelium, a layer of mold, if you will, around the entire earth. And this is similar to, to the internet, to a super highway. Now, the trees connect in from the very tips of their roots and connect into this mycelium and they use this for communicating to each other. They send out signals on health, on, on whether they're thirsty, whether there's a drought. Um, they send signals to each other to let each other know what to expect. And most important of all these signals is that signal coming from the mother tree. The mother tree is in the forest and there's many of them and a single mother tree is responsible for, for keeping the safety of about a hundred trees. They could be their children, they could be their nieces and nephews, but they're responsible for a whole lot of children and they send these messages out to their children letting them know based on their own experience what they can expect, letting them know that winter is coming and it's time to hibernate. But imagine this, when there's a forest fire that happens or there's a logging situation and they take down the mother tree and what you do is you interrupt the, the communication between a mother and her children and now the children are much like orphans. They they're, they're have to figure it out on their own and that's a very dangerous situation and it's always hard to tell where the mother tree is. But we're going to talk a little bit more about trees. Let's get into our next question. Does a tree feel? Let's get into that. When you cut into a tree, cut off a branch, does it feel it? My answer would be yes, and it's a scientific fact, because it'll start sending a signal. Now the signal moves relatively slow. It gets through the system, goes down into the roots, resends back again, and then it starts um, seeping out sap. That sap is its natural band-aid, it's antibiotic. Did you know that a tree, when it's cut down, takes approximately two weeks to actually die. It's missing its, its main system, it's missing its roots, but it's still photosynthesizing, it's still doing its things, but eventually it starves to death and eventually it dives of, of high dehydration. So does it feel? Now the root system, when you cut off a tree, the root system stays alive for several months, but now it's going to starve to death because it doesn't get photosynthesis. Does it feel? Now, there's trees, acacia trees in Africa. You've seen those uh, National Geographic shows where, where the, the giraffes are they're eating on the leaves of the acacia trees. They're eating on those leaves, and if you watch those films, you'll see that they'll just casually walk away. And they'll walk several hundred yards away from that tree. It's because the tree sent a signal. It sent a signal, and it's being damaged, and it needs protection then chemicals come out, ethylene. That ethylene will, will produce a bitter flavor to those leaves, but that ethylene is also floating the, through the air. It's floating through the air and it's sending the signal to other trees around it, so that's why the giraffe has to walk so, for so far, because all the other trees around it got the message, and it's no buffet today. 
Now let's talk about trees and sleeping. Do they sleep like us? Yeah, they do. Now they do have a different pattern in the winter time. In the winter time they go into oh, what we would consider maybe hibernation. They're in full dormancy. They're doing nothing. They're no, they're no photosynthesis is happening. Um, the pine trees, they'll actually wax over on the needles, um, protecting themselves and holding in the moisture. So um, they go to sleep. They prepare themselves much like you would prepare a cabin in the mountains for a winter time. You, you winterize it. Now the springtime comes along, those photoreceptors are seeing those, uh, the sun in a different position, so they start waking up, but they still need some sleep. They need sleep during their, their awake time, so at night they go to sleep. Now those trees in the city, they don't have the advantages that those forest trees have. In the city, those trees, when the nighttime comes, those lamps come on, those city lights. The cars are still going by those trees. It's loud, it's bright. Those trees in the city are much less healthy than their cousins in the forest because they lack sleep. Much like us, if we don't get a good night's sleep, we really don't, we're really not as productive as we would like to be. So allowing the trees to do their thing naturally in the forest and keeping away light pollution is really important to keeping those trees healthy. Now, trees, as we've gone over, provide a lot of benefits. They provide all that furniture, all that construction, but they also provide medicine. There's several trees. The willow tree. The willow tree has provided us with aspirin. Trees provide us with so much in our lives, and they're, they're very important. They're very similar to us in a lot of different ways. And I want you to consider that next time you're going through a forest and ask yourself that question again. Do you have enough trees in your yard to remove the carbon footprint? Four trees, one person. Thank you. Amazing work, all of you. Thank you for teaching us these wonderful words of wisdom. Science underground, science in the trees, animals where we would never think of it. I couldn't do better myself. But if you want to know more about science or nature, or say you want to experience some of these wonderful habitats, why don't you come on up and visit me here at Cave of the Winds. You can look us up online, caveofthewinds.com, or you can call if you have no interest in the interweb. I hope to see you soon, my friends, because there's always more to learn. Greetings and salutations, friends. Welcome to Cave of the Winds Mountain Park, home of our school program, where we will give you an inside look on a few of the ways we study the natural sciences. Weather, bats, geology, caves, many things to do, many to learn, with a healthy dose of fun. Here, we talk about the forces of nature, fire and lightning, two great and powerful things that we can see with our own eyes. We teach the importance of not only how they function, but how to respect them and be safe around them. Here, they will pan for crystals and gems and wonderful accoutrement to go to their day, a little take-home science for them to enjoy and show their friends. This is where we teach them in our bat classroom about bats. It is very important to remember that even though we are sometimes afraid of these lovely creatures, they do wonderful things for us as a species. So it is important to arm yourself with knowledge. Here, the children practice using sonar in order to travel across a vast distance, just like how bats do when they are navigating through cave darkness. They must work together, listening to their commands, squeaks, or clicks in order to make it to their team captain's side. This is our underground geological laboratory. Here we're going to educate them about the geological processes and, of course, about caves. You, if carbonic acid, if you have too much carbonic acid and you never brush your teeth, like from drinking too much soda, what do you get in your, in your teeth? A cavity. A cavity. Well, my friends, that is but a snippet of the many things we do up here together. So find us at caveofthewinds.com. Call the number below to find more information to learn and grow together. See you soon.